Go again. Ms. Chichen apparently has implied or has mentioned how conscious uh, Armenians are of images, both of their self-image and particularly of the external image, how others see them. Uh, all people, of course, are interested in image, but it is almost a hang-up uh, with the Armenians. I think in terms of uh, when Mannix every once in a while uses two Armenian terms or words, uh, all the Armenians uh, become extremely excited and think the entire world has understood that, uh, that he is an Armenian and that he is using Armenian. Um, when the... Uh, when the name of uh, Coach Ara Parserian was bantied around for many years as the coach of Notre Dame, uh, all the Armenians assumed that the world should know that because his name ended with IAN that he was an Armenian and that brought credit to them. Uh, and uh, conversely, in recent times when the, uh, apparently the uh, anti-defamation leagues of the, uh, of the Jews, the Italians, the Irish, the blacks, and, and so forth, are uh, causing the television script writers to find, uh, look uh, far afield or elsewhere for their rather, uh, for the villains of their, um, of their drama, sometimes uh, they'll find an, a name with an IAN to portray a villain, and this, of course, is extremely upsetting to the Armenians, thinking that uh, the whole world will now think the Armenians are villains. And uh, more realistic, you may remember a few years ago, there was a, a Manson trial, and there was a, a young lady there by the name of, of uh, Kasabian in the trial. Horrors to God. Uh, an Armenian. Ah, oh, you see? Did you see? Did you see what she did? That must be an Armenian speaking. She wasn't an Armenian. The defense immediately, the exactly, uh, the horrors that an IAN name was uh, linked up with crime and with Manson. With great relief did they learn that this unworthy woman was not an Armenian, that she had somehow back in her earlier life tricked an Armenian into marrying her and then left him. And then they were extremely frustrated by not being able, apparently, to, uh, to proclaim to the world that this was so. Well, it's a, a highly individualistic, a talented, somewhat stubborn uh, people, as individualistic people are, that we deal with. The, uh, in the United States, these people began to, well, the earliest of all, of course, was, was in Jamestown Colony in the early 1600s. In the Jamestown records, he's known as Martin E. Armenian, who was a, an expert, uh, was brought over specifically for sericulture or, or, or silk, uh, which was a specialization of the Armenian Highland. And individual Armenians have been in this country from the founding of it. But it was not until the 19th century the late 19th century in particular, that any significant numbers of Armenians came um, to this country. Uh, most of those who came in the early part of the 19th century, from 1830 to about 1880, were usually single uh, adult men who came for uh, college education, primarily on the Eastern Coast colleges, and many of them had been affiliated with the American Protestants uh, or pr American Protestant missions that had gone to the Near East. Now, the Armenians had been Christians for many centuries, but Protestantism brought in a certain revival, uh, evangelical revival, uh, and uh, found some converts. And many of these young men tended to come to the United States for education. But the um, first mass movement of Armenians to the United States occurred in the 1890s and paralleled the major, uh, the beginning of the major uh, tragedy for the Armenian people, uh, the massacres of them by the Turkish government. 
in the years 1894 to 1896, um, some 200,000 Armenians were massacred in the Turkish or Ottoman Empire, as it was then known. And this naturally brought over a wave of immigration, of people trying to flee at the same time that you have the movement of the Eastern European Jews, largely under Russian uh, rule, who began their movement to this country uh, about that same time. Uh, they were basically an agricultural people, but coming to this country, the most feasible means for most immigrant groups to make a living was to go into those terrible factories. And uh, Armenians, indeed, on the East Coast, starting from between Philadelphia and uh, up into Massachusetts, the, the shoe factories, the foundry works, and so forth, were largely employed in them and quickly branched out into what they like most, and that was being this little petty entrepreneurs, that is the petty bourgeoisie, uh, moving into grocery stores, cleaning establishment, uh, uh, cobblery, shoemaking, or repairing, and so forth and, and throughout that area. The, um, they, wherever they went, of course, the first thing throughout history that they did as an organization or as a group of people was to create a church or establish a church, and this they did the first of which was in Worcester, city of Worcester, Massachusetts, uh, at the turn of the century, just before uh, 1900, about 1898. At the same time, uh, the more ambitious and adventuring across the United States, way back, uh, the first of them way back in the 1860s, um, and so they still uh, were involved in Indian wars and so forth. But um, they came all the way across and uh, found uh, a rather semi-arid region that in some ways reminded them of their own homeland, and that was in the San Joaquin Valley, an area that uh, in the late 19th century was not at all what it is today in the sense of the the orchards and vineyards, but a semi-arid region, which if there is water, just as in their homeland, if there was water, uh, could produce a lot. And they began, therefore, the agricultural development and contributed heavily to the agricultural development of the San Joaquin Valley, particularly in the importation and the introduction of various varieties of grapes and figs uh, unknown to this country until that time. Uh, just as in the, the East Coast, so too in Fresno, which, was the, which is the heart of the San Joaquin Valley and the heart of uh, the Armenian community of California, we can say everyone has a relative in Fresno, or wherever they may live in California, uh, the, uh, they established in 1901 their church as well, the Holy Trinity uh, Armenian Church, which still remains in that city. So the church plays a very significant role in the culture of these people. The Los Angeles community, since most of you are in Los Angeles, you might be interesting, interested to know it, sort of burgeoned because of the cop-outs in the San Joaquin Valley. Those who couldn't make it in the San Joaquin Valley took the exit route to LA. And why couldn't they make it? There were good reasons if, uh, well, you're not so old as I, but in the 1930s uh, there was a rather bad few years for this country. As most immigrants the, who came in, the Armenians uh, had to borrow money from the banks for, to buy their properties. And they, uh, they are people that uh, cling to private property. That is, this concept of private property is very dear to them. And so they don't like um, to rent. Uh, they don't like to work for others. If they can work for themselves, they much prefer it so that many of these people who came to the San Joaquin Valley uh, immediately uh, bought farms and uh, began uh, their uh, payments to the bank. But um, in the Depression years brought many foreclosures to such a degree there are even some humorous Armenian songs about foreclosures and how the people who were foreclosed upon then went over to L.A. Uh, so the L.A. community in many ways uh, is, are from people who had tried tried to make a go in the San Joaquin Valley, and because of the Depression moved here. There was, of course, also a community already here. The early Armenian community of Los Angeles was in a region known as Boyle Heights, if you know LA well. Um, 
just at the beginning of East Los Angeles, uh, an area that is now largely Chicano, uh, but was uh, an area of Armenian and Slavic and other immigrant groups in the early part of the century. While our, uh, Los Angeles began, is this what you want me to talk about? Or you don't care? You want me to go directly into history? No, this is fine. This is fine. All right. I mean, you have one hour. What are we supposed to say? Uh, while, uh, while, uh, while, uh, while uh, Los Angeles ended up, uh, or not, began as a sort of a second-rate Armenian community, it has today become the largest and the most varied of all the communities in North America. Uh, and there are a number of factors aside, uh, well, a number of factors that would account for this. Until, uh, until the um, there's some chairs here. Looks terrible. I'll hold it for you. It has become one of the most varied and colorful of the communities because of the, of the uh, elements that have been fed into it. Uh, whereas most uh, Armenian American communities uh, were composed or are composed of the immigrants who fled the massacres uh, in the 1890s and then the uh, genocide of 1915, which was the worst of all the calamities of these people. Um, the Armenian community of Los Angeles is one that has been fed into constantly. After the flight of the refugees in 1900s, uh, early 1900s up to 1920, then after World War II, with the upheavals taking part in many other parts of the world, there uh, and the Armenians feeling themselves in threatened, and indeed they were in many ways, at least economically threatened in many parts of the world, they began to, uh, groups of these people began to move from such uh, regions as the Near East and the Arab countries, from Egypt, from Iraq, from Syria, what from today is Israel or Palestine in the great troubles that they had in those, um, in, in that region for many years. Or um, the communist takeover of Bulgaria and Romania uh, in the Balkan Peninsula caused many people to flee fair. And even from China, there are Armenians everywhere, of course. Uh, the uh, communist uh, revolution in China uh, dispersed and destroyed, in fact, the small Armenian communities in such cities as Shanghai, uh, Harbin, Mukden, uh, and so forth, people who had um, fled from the original massacres in 1890s to 1915 and then scattered out. So that we, we have in this community in Los Angeles as I said, one of the most vibrant, varied, multi-layered and multi-structured uh, communities which, is a, which, which would constitute a fascinating uh, subject for a sociological study. Perhaps that one of the reasons that the Armenians are so identity conscious uh, and are uh, concerned about uh, so much about what others think of them is the fact that they have been dispersed by the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune uh, over the uh, centuries and that they have now, in fact, at the beginning of this century, nearly been eliminated from their historic homeland. I give these words of introduction uh, simply to lead us back a little bit into the history of these uh, people. Uh, one can say very little in the half hour or so that we have now to talk about it, except to uh, point out a few basic factors. Yeah. This uh, was historic Armenia here. Mediterranean Sea, Black Sea. Uh, today, most of what was historic Armenia constitutes the eastern half of the country of Turkey. Uh, a very small part of it lies in northern Iran, and a larger seg segment uh, lies 
in the Soviet Union here around the city of Yerevan and is the only area of the historic homeland in which Armenian life continues on the native soil constituted in this small region as one of the 15 republics of the USSR, the Armenian SSR, with its capital of Yerevan, dating back some three, nearly 3,000 years, according to their tradition. So that Armenian life as a national uh, collectiveness goes on only in this small region where there are about 2 million of the world's 5 million Armenians. Um, whereas all the lands from which, for example, most of, the, of any of you who is Armenian in this classroom or most of the Armenians in Los Angeles, most of their parents uh, would not have come from this region. Nearly all of them uh, come from this region, uh, of whence they were expelled uh, through a very horrendous, horrendous tortures and massacres in, um, starting in 1896, but as I say, culminating in 1915 when the entire population, men, women, and children, were either massacred or forced to flee from the region. Uh, who are the Armenians? Uh, I don't want you to hold that all hour. Let me, why don't you put it in your black clip? Sir? It didn't hold, it was heavy. Yeah. No, that's okay. Uh, I can bring in a nail. That's okay. Let me that's, get my nail and no, 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 it's all right. When, it, when it's necessary, I just don't want to let it hang there because it, uh, it's distracting to you. Uh, who are these people? Um, many people think that they should have disappeared into history along with the Assyrians, the Babylonians, and others who, with whom they were contemporaries. Their history dates back to the first millennia BC, that is the first thousand years before the Christian era. According to their own tradition, other epic, they are the direct descendants of Noah through Noah's sons, uh, Japheth and Tor, and then the grandson, uh, Torgoma or Torgom. And uh, they find their patronymic father from that line. Now, however, we have found uh, through historical, archeological, and other studies that the Armenians actually were merged into a single nation or a single people between about the year 900 BC and 500 BC, combining, combining the original inhabitants, the, the prehistoric inhabitants of these areas who were largely mm, squat, round-faced, uh, rather uh, Heavy set uh, individuals yeah. whose uh, anthropological characteristics, one of them of which was a flat head, and if you are a good Armenian, you will have a flat head. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, uh, you have to get rid of all the hair first. <laughs> the, uh, but the other element, and that was the predominant element, were the light-skinned, and that's in the, of course, they remember this in their tradition, because their epic founder was supposed to be a man, a, a giant, with blonde, flowing hair and blue eyes. His name was Haik, and they called themselves in their own language, Hai, after their epic founder. But they remember, they remember the Indo-European element of themselves, that is the group that moved in between 1000 and 600 BC, these light-skinned, uh, blue-eyed, and rather wild peoples, as the Indo-Europeans were all over the world at that time. That is the sedentary, the ancient Semitic, um, uh, Indian, and, and other uh, civilizations were really wiped out by these Indo-Europeans that spread all over the world uh, for centuries. But then, of course, the, in the case of the Armenian Indo-Europeans, they were fortunate because they merged with a people that were already there, that already had a very high civilization, known as the Uartuans. And the Uartuans and the, uh, the Armen tribes merging between 1000 BC and 600 or 500 BC brings together these two elements. 
So it's not really surprising that you might find among Armenians um, still the contrast of, um, of light skin, blue eyes, light hair, uh, dark, squat, uh, uh, bushy eyebrowed types. Um, they, like most other people, they have mixed, although their mixture take place at a very early time in history. Between 600 BC and 1400 AD, now that is, I'm afraid to ask if you know what BC and AD means. I just <laughs> go through this all the time. We do it every year at UCLA, and AD is after death, and it's uh, after many other things. But uh, okay, between 600 BC and 1480, that is a period of 2,000 years. Uh, these people held uh, themselves as a independent or autonomous kingdom in the crossroads of Eastern and Western civilization. It was um, both, it was to their credit that they were able to um, retain an identity as a small people because they were never more at most than a few million, uh, three or four million people at a time when empires around them held 50 million uh, people. But they uh, were in this crossroad of Western civilization because it was from the West that came the empire of Alexander the Great, the Greek uh, cities and the Greek concepts. Rome followed. After Rome came Byzantium. From the East, um, the great empires of the Eastern world, the Persian Achaemenids, 6th century BC, um, then the uh, Parthians, the Sassanids, and uh, in Armenian history, a very black date, the 11th century, the arrival for the first time of the Turkish hordes from Central Asia as they began to move out in their movement that was to take um, two or three centuries uh, destroying all before them. Well, here they were on this land then for 2,000 years as a kingdom with kings, with several dynasties, periods of time when there was foreign rule and foreign invasion, but by and large they were able to hold their own. Um, their land, and one of the reasons that they were able to, was a difficult land for a foreign army to conquer and to hold. It was mountainous, high plateaus, uh, mountain valleys and streams uh, throughout this area. While the, while the conqueror could hold and control the major cities uh, through the major thoroughfares of the country, the mountains about were always shelter for thousands of people who did not want to submit or who would not submit to foreign domination. <coughs> the fact that Armenia was on the crossroads of the Eastern and Western empires, uh, of course, was something for which it suffered because of the uh, frequent invasions, warfare, and devastation. And over the centuries, uh, literally millions of Armenians having been lost through captivity, taken away into slavery, and being lost or assimilating into the peoples who took them. On the other hand, it gave to the Armenians a one of the secrets, perhaps, of their survival. Um, and that was the ability to withstand all of this. It bred a very hardy race, uh, this highland mountainous region. Uh, the survival of the fittest was, was indeed true. You either were healthy and strong or you died. Um, and it, it bred a healthy race of people uh, that was able to hold out as a national uh, entity. It is not that the great empires to east and west did not want to conquer this land. They frequently did, but uh, they were unable to and recognized largely throughout history that it would be better to have this country as a buffer between them than uh, and, um, to continuously fight over it. At the same time that it remained a buffer, it was also a buffer for ideas, for cultural ideas, because the main international trade routes led from India and China through Central Asia, down in this direction, and through southern Armenia to the Mediterranean and to the, and to the Black Sea. This 
region was desert to the south, and therefore the caravans did not traverse it. Being on the major crossroads or the caravan routes, therefore, the, the ideas and concepts of Orient and Occident frequently met in this country and were exchanged. The Armenians borrowed, frequently borrowed cultural ideas. They borrowed the Chinese dragon for some of their tapestries uh, and some of their miniature paintings. They borrowed Western forms in, uh, at their court, but always adapting these to their own situation, to their own mountains, um, uh, creating a uh, blend but a unique culture for themselves here. Now, the period of, of 2,000 years of kingdom is a very long span of time, particularly in this part of the world. And as, I, uh, as I indicate here, the, one of the important um, factors in the later period of their retaining the strong sense of national cultural identity was their adoption of the Christian faith in the uh, third century of the Christian era. According to Armenian tradition, uh, Christ sent two of his disciples, apostles Thaddeus and Jude Bartholomew, to Armenia, who, uh, according to tradition, to tradition converted the, uh, one of the princes of Armenia and members of his royal family, of, of, the, um, of the royal family. But um, in fact, in fact, it was not until about the year 300 or 301 AD that the king of Armenia and all his court was baptized and uh, Christianity was declared the official religion of Armenia. The Armenians somehow take pride in the fact that their state or their king was the first to declare Christianity as the religion uh, of any realm that was then existing. A few years later, uh, the emperor of the West, Constantine, declared Christianity an equal religion in the Roman Empire, and it was not until the end of the fourth century that Christianity was declared the official religion of the Roman Empire. Now, Christianity has taken uh, many sacrifices from these people. In the name of that faith, in the name of that faith, and their stubborn persistence in retaining it, when everyone around them became Muslim or adopted another faith, uh, through the centuries, they suffered not only the loss of uh, hundreds of thousands and indeed millions of people through uh, warfare and captivity and slavery, but also after the 14th century in particular, when they came under Turkish domination, when the Turks spread out and they kept, the Turks kept on coming. Uh, generation after generation, it's difficult for us sitting here to imagine the utter horror that the Armenians had to feel when they saw these odd-looking individuals coming forward from the steppes of Central Asia with fire and devastation before them, and a part of their policy was to pull up every vine and tree and mulberry bush that there was to turn the land back into <coughs> its original form into pasture so it would be suitable for their flocks because they were nomads. They had herds of sheep and goat. The destruction of sedentary society took place for um, generations of these people who still would not uh, disavow their Christian faith. As the cost for that, aside from their physical sacrifices, they had to submit or subject themselves to what we now call second-class citizenship in the empire's that uh, under which they came. From the 14th century onward, certainly, and even before that time, when, where the areas, because all this area that you see here comes into what is known as the Turkish Ottoman Empire from the 15th century to the 20th century. And for those five centuries, five centuries, uh, the Armenians uh, live as second class citizens. Now, what does second class citizenship mean? It means that 
uh, you are officially recognized by the state as being inferior and having to uh, comply with certain regulations and certain extraordinary conditions such as particular their national church, which had uh, established its own hierarchy throughout the centuries and was regarded as one of the ancient churches along with the Greek Orthodox and the Roman Catholic churches. But also in this time, they lost a great deal of the culture, the urban civilization that had characterized their ancient their kingdoms were based on huge cities. These were an urban, they were urban uh, civilization in which the concept of Hellenism, the Greco Euro Asiatic concepts prevailed. Uh, cities of 200,000 people, 100,000, 200,000 people were not rare in the ancient world, in the ancient Armenia, whereas in modern Armenia, 15th and 20th century, one could not find a city of 20 or 25. Uh, a breakdown of the urban culture, the urban civilization, a move toward uh, sharecropping, toward uh, agrarian uh, autarky that is needing self-sufficing. You spin your own clothes, you make your own tools. And that. The descent of the Armenians into darkness uh, lasted for a long period, that is two or three hundred years at least, four hundred years, which is a long time. And the light only began to dawn when the Armenians uh, were exposed to a uh, rediscovery of themselves that was partly generated by their own leaders, but also in large measure generated by foreigners, by Europeans, who began to take an interest in the ancient Near East. The 18th and 19th century, as you know, in Europe was a time of great excitement, of exploration, of discovery of the peoples of the East. They rediscovered their Greek heritage, and they wrote these marvelous little ditties about oaks to Grecian urns and things of that type. Uh, in the same period, the Europeans began to assist the peoples of the ancient peoples of the East to find out who they were once again. And this said, this was bound up also with increase in the number of schools, literacy began to rise, uh, a national literature once again began to be written. Now what happens to a people who is in subjugation or which is in subjugation or at least under oppressive rule? when it begins to discover or rediscover itself, to uh, rediscover an ancient past in which it takes pride, and to begin to feel and to question why it is that today they should be in second class citizenship. A uh, potential conflict is arising, obviously, uh, with between the master and subject relationship. The Armenians, as they become more and uh, pass through their own renaissance in the 18th and particularly in the 19th century, um, begin to ask what we call, or ask for what we call today, civil rights. That is, the right of equal taxation, the right of equal military service, the right of representative councils, and ultimately what they are asking for is autonomy that is internal self-rule, cultural <coughs> cultural self-development and self-rule uh, within the great Turkish Empire. The tragedy for the Armenians in the 19th century was that at the time that their awareness was awakening and rising, at the, at the same time that that was going on, the Turkish Empire was becoming more corrupt and more oppressive and uh, more inept. There was a time when the Turks first took over Constantinople in the 15th century, when they had very uh, manly, virile leaders or sultans who went out on campaigns and they had a good administrative system for a while. But as time went on, the Turks became um, 
as many times uh, nomadic empires will become. Once you become sedentary, you become soft, you enjoy your harem too much, uh, you become fat, and you can't sit on a horse. Uh, and then, what for, of course, for the Turks, what the worst thing was is they learned they could borrow. Uh, borrow money. Who were they going to borrow from? But the good European capitalists and imperialists. And so we have the Turkish sultans now becoming heavily in debt to Europe, uh, needing to pay their debt. They therefore have to suppress their subject peoples more, try to get more taxes uh, uh, in order to pay off this debt. So you have this dual situation in which Armenian uh, awareness is increasing, therefore tolerance of oppression or tolerance of injustice is decreasing because when your awareness increases, your tolerance decreases, right? Yeah. On the same, uh, in the same way, uh, at the very same time that the conditions were not becoming better in the empire in which they lived were becoming worse. This caused in the 19th century, a lot of part of the 19th century, what is known as the Armenian question. What was to be happened to these Oriental Christians stuck out in what had now become a Muslim sea of peoples around them, struggling for uh, retaining an identity, uh, looking frequently to Europe for support. But unfortunately, each time that Europe attempted to intervene, it did not intervene with force, if the conditions for the Armenians became worse. What they were looking for in the latter part of the 19th century was um, were reforms uh, based, as I've mentioned, on largely what we call cultural and political autonomy, not separation from the Turkish Empire or independence, certainly not at that stage, but um, the right to self. This, um, they had some hopes that they should receive this because other Christians who had remained under Turkish rule for several centuries such as the Greeks, the Romanians, the Bulgarians, the Serbians, the Macedonians, the Albanians, etc. All of these people eventually gained their freedom, or at least their cultural and political autonomy. The problem for the Armenians was that they were in Asia Minor, not so close to Europe as were the other Christians of the Turkish Empire, and uh, therefore much more difficult uh, for them to receive any type of assistance. The latter quarter of the 19th century in Turkish history is dominated by a man that the Armenians have termed and European authors have termed the Bloody Sultan, his name is Sultan Amin, uh, who launched these first major massacres in the 1890s, 1894, 1890s. But these were not to be the worst. The worst, as I mentioned, was to come in 1915, when under the cover of World War I, Turkish government used the excuse that uh, they needed to move the Armenians away from zones of war, where the zones of war was was not clear, it meant for them the total elimination of the Armenian population within their empire. Uh, and the stories that one can hear in oral history conversations are about just too horrendous to believe. That is, even those of us who have been reared on those stories find, um, want to believe that our grandparents have exaggerated the horrors of the torture. The, uh, this trauma through which the Armenians passed in 1915 as a people uh, has not yet been overcome. They're still traumatized. Uh, they're traumatized by the word Turk. They're traumatized by a sense of burning injustice. Uh, and they are envious, if I may use the word, of the Jews, for example. Envious because they felt that although the Jews, like themselves, suffered ex extremely uh, or, or extensively, there was at least international recognition of the wrongdoing, both by the world community and particularly by the German government case of the Jews, uh, something that never occurred in the Armenian experience. At the same time, if, if we want to uh, turn the Armenian attitude toward the Middle East today, one can say that 
uh, the, the Armenians uh, feel themselves both Israeli and Arab. They feel themselves, in a sense, Israeli, or they, they can identify with the Israelis in the sense that here was a people like themselves that was kicked around for a long period of time, that was dispersed for centuries, and finally uh, returned to a homeland, something which they still, the Armenians still here to do. And so there is that identification that they can make with the Israelis. At the same time, they, they identify with the Palestinians, because just like they, the Palestinians were expelled or driven from a homeland and uh, are scattered about, uh, needing and, and claiming a, a right to return to a homeland just as the Armenians do. So there is this, this dichotomy, and I hope that you can see the, the situation that it may uh, create. The uh, most uh, optimistic, perhaps, situation for the Armenians is that not all of the historic territory was lost and that that small area of around 10 to 12,000 square miles if that much uh, largely rocky etc about 2 million people the capital city is a, has a nearly 3 quarters of a million people so it's a very important part of the country of Yerevan that the national life, the national culture continues here in spite of the restrictions that may be imposed from Moscow or Soviet rule. That is, people under foreign rule or under domination have a way of avoiding the restrictions, and uh, the national life continues uh, in, in this region. Now, uh, these may be, as I very briefly uh, point out, some of the reasons that you find among uh, Armenians, wherever you will meet them, a strongly, uh, strong sense of identity, of individuality, of uh, concern that people know who they are and concern that people think well of them. Uh, very important. Uh, this is a very brief inter overview, and now I would like to entertain perhaps some questions that I might uh, elucidate at uh, some point. That, uh, how many Armenians now? It's difficult to say exactly how many they are. There is no good, of course, there's no world census. There is no Armenian census. Uh, but the estimate is that in 1915, when they were uh, subjected to the genocide, there were in the world uh, about 4 million Armenians, uh, about 2.5 million of which lived in the Turkish Empire. And the others were in the Russian half. Now, the majority of those two and a half million were, uh, died uh, as a result of the uh, massacres. And by the 1950s, uh, it was estimated they had, uh, this Armenian regeneration had been such that they had replaced themselves and that by now, they have now gone above what they were. There are now about five million Armenians uh, worldwide. It's estimated some rising upward, I would say, now to, with all the, uh, the Armenians are very fertile people, you may know, uh, with all the children that run around, and the, uh, there must be some uh, half million Armenians in the United States. It doesn't sound like a very large community in comparison with Poles and others, but they are uh, uh, the people that uh, try to make themselves uh, shown or are here in many places, shall we say, and give the impression of being more than they are at that many times. The other major area in which the Armenians lived was in the Middle East, that is in those Arab countries that I mentioned, in, in Egypt, in Syria, in Lebanon, where the largest Armenian community today uh, is in the, in the throes of chaos because of the civil war that has been going on in that country for nearly two years, and the community of more than 150,000 Armenians sitting in the middle of the fighting sides, trying to hold a position of what they call positive neutrality between radical Muslim and radical Christian, and saying, look, just lay off. Uh, we are here to protect this region, and we are opposed to war. And they're, in so doing, of course, bringing upon them also the spite 
of the radicals and say, look, you're either for us or against us, you can't be in between. Uh, the difficulties of the community, of a minority community, because they're a minority in the Middle East, the time to retain, they came there as refugees from Turkey in 1915 to 1920. They worked for a half century to build in that little country of Lebanon, uh, some 35 churches and perhaps 100 or more, more schools of their own, uh, and became very economically secure uh, to face this insecurity once again. So uh, that's an answer, uh, a roundabout answer to your question. The, uh, the other question that we have to ask pretty soon is what is an Armenian? That is, when does an, an Armenian stop being an Armenian? Uh, we are now in a movement of strong intermarriage, uh, that uh, we are now approaching areas where they're not only half Armenians, but they're now quarter Armenians and one-eighth Armenians. And uh, at what stage, uh, I think William Soroya and one of his one of his uh, books has a marvelous, uh, a marvelous, uh, what do you call it? A dedication page. It was, you know, it's to, to all the Armenians, half Armenians, eighth, uh, quarter Armenians, eighth Armenians, and and then and then it says after that it doesn't matter. Or else they makes stop there. That's the point. So that is a question particularly in the Western world, in North America, in, in Europe, uh, the process of assimilation uh, proceeds side by side with that same process of stronger identity for those who continue to identify, and uh, movement or influx of Armenians from other parts of the world. Now, there's also, uh, Armenian communities are not without friction. You should know that, because all communities are not without friction. There's an interesting thing. My generation born here uh, is naturally and natively English speaking, whereas another Armenian uh, of my generation, born in Lebanon and Syria, uh, in, in Egypt, will not will uh, not be Arabic speaking uh, natively of the country, but will be natively Armenian speaking. He has gone to Armenian schools. He feels a certain a great sense of loyalty and pride. And so you have the arrival of different of the same age group, but from different cultures, people, uh, put side by side. One who is native Armenian speaking may, may or may not be Armenian. Uh, another who is Armenian speaking. So there are these interesting internal aspects of Armenian life uh, in this country. By and large, however, there are, um, the Armenians have become largely an establishment crowd. They've done uh, well economically for themselves. They have uh, they uh, look uh, with almost awesomeness on on lawless, law-abidingness. That is, my father-in-law gets his PG and E bill and runs down the first day to pay it because he doesn't want to be two days late. He's frightened, you know, the police may come or it may they may reflect badly. We have to pay our bills on time. Uh, this type of attitude is very common. Yes? Now, could you elaborate more on the religion? No. Uh, your handout has a picture of the Holy See. Now, you also have a Holy Sepulchre to introduce it, right? No. Is the, there a yes. division? Or no, 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 yes. The, uh, no, no. <laughs> yes, there is a Holy Sepulchre. No, there is no. <laughs> uh, the Armenian Apostolic Church, as it calls itself, the Armenian Apostolic Church has, as the Greek Orthodox Church, as the Roman Catholic Church, a, a leader or a, a chief individual, um, title of which is Katholikos, which means the Universal Father. The see, the Holy See of the Armenian Apostolic Church, the historic see, is in just outside of Yerevan, that is in that little state of Soviet Armenia. Now, aside from him, there are other patriarchs uh, in other parts of the world. In Jerusalem, because Jerusalem was very important to Christianity, the Armenians established a patriarchate there, that is a, a division of the church there. As early as the 6th and 7th century AD, many of the churches, if you ever get to Jerusalem, you'll see that many of the churches are, are sort of shared by several faiths, and normally the three 
the, the three ancient faiths, of, that is the, the Roman Catholic, the Greek Orthodox, and the Armenian, the little Armenians uh, next to them, sort of have a monopoly, or almost a monopoly, on the uh, major religious centers of Jerusalem. But uh, the church the, is a national church. It has a hierarchy of both celibate and non-celibate clergy. It, unlike the Roman Catholic Church, has from the outset believed that parish priests should be not only married, but family men to best understand the uh, needs and difficulties of their parishioners. So that on the uh, parish level, the local level, uh, the Armenian Apostolic Church, as the Greek Orthodox Church, uh, insists on or has insisted on uh, married clergy. And every once in a while when they get a non-married man just visiting, it's a disaster usually because the temptations of this world are too great. Uh, aside from the um, aside from the uh, the parish priest, there is the hierarchy, the old hierarchy of, of celibate clergy, who are the administrative positions. And in the old times, that is, people such as the monks, who uh, would spend half their life just doing one beautiful illuminated manuscript, uh, with just exquisite, exquisite capabilities and abilities, the paints of which are some now eight or nine hundred years old, look as if they've just been touched, even though these manuscripts have been through all kinds of hell. So the church is, is one. There are some administrative divisions within it. Uh, there are some uh, uh, multiple patriarchates. But uh, the dogma uh, and the structure of it is, is the same. The Patriarchate at Jerusalem, and if there's an Armenian quarter in Jerusalem, was put there simply to protect the rights of the Armenian, of the Armenian Church in, the, in that city. So if you go into the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which is a fascinating, fascinating place, I always liked it. I think, without being sacrilegious, I think of it as a fun house because the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which by tradition was built by Saint Helena, the mother of Constantine the Great, um, is a church with no electrical lighting uh, unless they put it in recently it's all candle lit and there are about 50 or more chapels upstairs downstairs through little winding doors and so forth so you can go all over the place and uh, you hear at the same time latin and greek and armenian and coptic uh, and, and whatever the protestants have relieved themselves because they've gone outside and found themselves a garden tomb outside the walls so this is where jesus went up to heaven uh, and so they've relieved themselves of all the incense and uh, and the excitement that goes on in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. How many Armenians in Los Angeles right now? Uh, Almost 100. That's difficult, again, to say. There have been some estimates made. The, uh, up until recently, the uh, statement has been 50,000, 60,000 in central Los Angeles, but as we know, uh, nearly every plane that comes from Europe brings in more of these people from the Near East, and uh, I have been told that within the last three or four years in the Hollywood area, uh, there, there's been an influx of no fewer than 10,000 Armenians into that very area. Um, does anyone teach in that area? No. They didn't show yeah. They want me to go down. Do you want you to go down there and straighten them all up? Well, no. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, well, I know. I live in the community. Yes. Yeah. 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 And nearly all of these people are uh, the immigrants of the last 10 to 15 years. That is, those who will be still natively Armenian speaking, still culturally very close in, in family ways. Uh, and added to them, it's interesting that with the uh, pressure on the Soviet Union imposed largely by world Jewry to allow Jewish emigration, as you know, the Soviets have had also to allow certain other uh, elements to leave or, or at least token departure. So that we're having now a, a brand new element appearing in the Los Angeles community. And these are people who have been reared in the Soviet Union that is, Armenians from the Soviet Union who have gotten out and who are coming out. And they are a breed unto themselves. That they, uh, they sometimes there are, I understand there are some minor problems with them in Hollywood schools, which is understandable because they have come 
from a system in which you have to wheel and deal uh, to get ahead. And it's very difficult to come to a, to a place and say, okay, um, you know, here's, a, here's five uh, pieces of crayon. Put them in the box when you're finished. It's very hard for a good wheeler and dealer not to put them in his pocket and walk out with them. <laughs> and so, you know, the whole question of conditioning, so that these are problems that probably not, would not continue, but probably uh, for the first time in Armenian American history may pertain to some school of Hollywood. And I don't want to stigmatize Hollywood, but may do. Armenians, again, you see, they're worried about image. They right? imply an image here. It's an image. What will others think of? That is a very important aspect of it. Um, it doesn't matter that uh, three quarters of the other kids may do the same thing. It's what we want to be saying. Yes? How much of the oral history has been recorded? Very little. Very little oral history. It's a uh, great shame as I see it. Uh, oral history, as you probably know, is the recording of the experiences, cultural, social, political experience of the individuals. And we had a generation of people, uh, my grandparents' uh, generation, who were expelled, who were the last generation of people to live on the historic homeland, and were expelled from it. And their experiences, their descriptions of the land, etc., should have been recorded. The Armenians have been very, very slow in this. Um, well, first of all, tape recording, of course, didn't come into its own until the 1950s. But after that, the, organ the Armenians have usually been so busy trying to support a church uh, or to get up on their feet uh, and so forth that they have not given the direction to oral history that, say, the Jews have done. They've done a marvelous job with, uh, with recording. There have been a few, few done, but we're losing it, the, the experience and the importance of oral history for, I think, many groups um, is, uh, is a field uh, that has to be developed and recognized and respected. Because we, we even, even for those of us whose grandparents may have been Native American born, when you think of all the experience that they may have had, that you would like to preserve, and what rich source material it is for writing in history, one could feel the loss of not recording this whole generation of people who today uh, are left like dry leaves upon the tree. Ask them. <laughs> no. Okay. Now, now that. In what direction should we go? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> the Ar Armenians have always prayed for uh, for advice. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, uh, that that is a question I cannot answer. What direction they must go is far beyond me to attempt to, to give any suggestion. It is something that is collective, collective thinking, collective organization, or else the creation of. Marvelous dictators. Uh, and as you know, the Armenians don't like dictators. They don't allow them. That's one of the other problems. They never allow a dictator or strong leader. Uh, you have a speech about Armenian history. Yes. Shall we say go and get your land or uh, keep your culture or what should, what should we have? Do it all. 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 This is, a, this is something that I say what should be done in each community. I think uh, each community and each area has to decide uh, what its own priorities are. Uh, in absence of a world Armenian Congress, in absence of a world Armenian organization, then it's left up to each I think, to do what they can. And conditions in each country are different. They are certainly different in Los Angeles than they are in, in uh, Cairo, Egypt. What can be said is that, as a community, they had better take advantage of the opportunity they now have, when there's so much excitement about cultural heritage, roots, and so forth, because that won't always last, uh, that you'd better make the best of it and, and inculcate and use uh, as best you can this favorable atmosphere. You know, there was a time in my lifetime when you talked about ethnic 
heritage, you were a damn foreigner in this country and in this city or in other cities. Uh, so that um, not anymore, but ducks. The Armenian always has one foot in the stir. One doesn't know. Uh, so that in this in this uh, situation, one can say that if there is a leadership of that community of the Armenian, if there is a leadership, then it should address itself to these problems. In the 1930s, Armenians were very pressure of applying to Turkey and convert to the Armenian Armenia, yeah. In, uh, after World War One. The whole